Yes, it's being taken care of. Okay, if not, you're in charge. Um, Ephesians 5, uh, starting with verse uh, 1, says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Um, be imitators, right? Be, be, um, be imitators of God. When my son Justin was a little kid, he was this amazing mimic. He could mimic anybody. Um, he would sound exactly like the person. He would mimic songs on the radio. He would have all the characteristics of that. Um, and he, on his own, at age three, had developed a little repertoire of, of like, he would imitate or mimic each family member. So you would say to him, hey, Justin, what does Grandma Bernice say? And he would mimic her voice exactly and all the little actions that went with it. And he would say, I'm going to have to check those hands because that's what my mom always said to him after the meal, um, making sure that he didn't touch the wallpaper and get things dirty. I'm going to have to check those hands. And then she'd come with a, a wash rag and wipe his hands and, and make a big game out of it. And, and uh, he would get the cadence of her voice exactly right. He'd get the right inflection. Um, he'd make all the motions. And he had a similar routine for every single member of our extended family. Aunt Miriam would always say, baby ducks, when she'd get upset. And, you know, baby ducks. And he would sound just like her. Um... When you'd say, what does Grandpa Herm say? He'd say, ah, shucks, right? And that was good old Grandpa Herm whenever something didn't quite go right. Ah, shucks. Uncle Mark would always stroke his beard. Stroke his beard for a while, and then he'd say, hmm, let's see. And Justin would get that down perfectly including, I mean, there's nothing more fun than watching a three-year-old stroke an imaginary beard, right? And go, hmm, let's see. He'd have to use the lowest voice he could muster to do that, which was also pretty funny. He would get the tone exactly right when he would imitate his mother. His mother would always say, oh, it's going to be okay. Okay. And he would do the little tongue click and look at, you know, have that same scrunched up face and, oh, it's going to be okay. Because that's what Kathy did. She's a nurse. She would make things okay. Anyway, it was a hoot at family gatherings to watch him do his thing. It was really fun. And um, when he would go to bed at night, I would tuck him in and say goodnight to him, and in my best Count Dracula voice, I would say, do not be afraid. All I want is to bite your neck. Blah! And then I would, you know, grab him and snuggle his neck and, and kiss him goodnight. So when he asked, when he was asked, what does daddy say? He would imitate me imitating Count Dracula. Great fun to listen to a three-year-old mimic somebody who was mimicking a Sesame Street character. By the way, forget telling your kids what to do or to do as you say. Kids do what you do. They mimic you. If you don't like something in your kid, it's probably because you don't like it in you, right? You begin to see yourself in them. They're always watching. They're always listening. They're always paying attention. They're always careful to, to look at you and study you. 
If you're anxious, they're anxious. If you gripe about the state of politics, that's what they'll do. If you're bar bored watching Zoom church, flopped out on the couch, well then they're flopped out, not paying much attention either. Kids, pay attention to your actions. They watch you. You can't make kids ignore your actions much as you might wish you could. And it's that attention that Paul invites the Ephesians and us into, that paying attention, paying attention to God the Father. He invites them and invites us to be imitators of God as dearly beloved children. Like Justin, when he was little, we're invited to pay careful attention to our father, to our dad. And to do that, we're called to imitate Jesus, who, according to Scripture, is the very image of the Father. Colossians 1, 15-17 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the image of the invisible God. If you want to look at God, if you want to know what God's like, you look at Jesus. And you say, well, Rod, that's kind of hard because Jesus isn't here either. But he is here, and he's here in Scripture, and so is God. And we can go and read Scripture, and we can study who Jesus is, and we can look at his attributes, and we can imitate him. We can imitate that which he is. In Jesus, we see the Father. And in imitating Jesus, we imitate the Father. John 5, verse 19 says, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. Whatever you see Jesus doing, it's what the Father's doing. Whatever you see the Father doing is what Jesus is doing. We are to imitate that. We're to be imitators of God. So if you're going to imitate someone, you should probably know what that's like, right? You should probably know what they're like. You should study them. I, I spent... Um, a good part of this week, just reading through the Gospels um, like numerous times, like, like all four Gospels, I spent some time just scanning through them and then just realizing what it is that Jesus does and, and what he says. Unlike us, there's no difference between Jesus' words and Jesus' actions, right? We can say one thing and do another that's what our kids point out to us. We're frauds, right? Um, Jesus isn't. What, you, what he says, he does. What he does, he says. It's, there's no difference. One of the things that I noticed as I looked through the Gospels and as I read through them again was just how often Jesus would get alone with his Father. He would just go off and be alone. Luke 6, 12 through 13 says, In those days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called the disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. I, I guess I had never seen that before, right? He went to the mountain to pray, he spent all night praying, and when day came, then he went and called out the disciples and, made, and named them apostles. Is, is that how you deal with your decisions? Big decisions. I mean, it's big decisions to declare these people his followers, his apostles, those that he's chosen. That's, that's a big decision, and he spends all night praying and talking to the Father. Is that what you do when you're facing a big decision in your life? 
Or do you just sit up all night stressing about how horrible it's going to be or i got to make this decision, I don't know what to do, blah, blah, blah. And like, are you anxious all night or are you in prayer? If you're imitating Jesus, if you're doing what Jesus did, then you're this person who spends the night praying whenever there's this major decision that needs to be made, whenever there's this big thing that you have to do. If you remember before Jesus goes uh, out into the wilderness to be tempted, he prays. When you're struggling with major temptations, when, when there's that, that incessant call to sin, to, to, to move towards evil instead of towards good, what does Jesus do? He prays. It's, it's amazing to be alone with God and to simply be in communion with him, to just be chatting with him, to just be hanging out with him. What a privilege that we can just go talk to him about anything. And he identifies with us. Scripture says that he's not... He's not aloof from us. We, we think that sometimes, that God's up in heaven somewhere, Jesus is up there at his thro- on his throne. The, like, it doesn't have anything to do with us. We're not, he's not personal. He's not there. It's interesting, in Matthew 14, verse 13, um, Jesus is told that uh, his cousin and friend, John the Baptist, had been beheaded he doesn't, he doesn't respond by going, oh, no, that's awful, and oh, we better make arrangements, and what are we going to do? He, he says no. In Matthew 14, 13, he says, now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a, le- a desolate place by himself. It's beautiful that Jesus grieves, that he mourns the loss of his friend, and that he withdraws and goes to spend time with his father. He goes to a desolate place, a place to get away. Do you, do you have those places in your life? Are you so busy with the events of this world? Are you so busy with all the things going around you that you don't even take time to mourn and grieve? This past week, um, a dear friend of mine uh, his wife uh, passed away from cancer. Um, another friend of mine, um, his wife's parents, uh, got a COVID diagnosis, went to the hospital. His um, his mother-in-law passed away, and um, and his father-in-law is barely hanging on to life. And they're going. They're planning on doing soon a, a double funeral. There's a lot of grief. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of things to grieve in this world. When you do that, getting alone with God, being separated out. I know in my own personal experience, when Derek was in the hospital suffering from the H1N1, and they gave us the news that he was dying and um, that we needed to make arrangements. I, I remember just going into this room and having it out with God and just being able to talk to him and, and yell at him and just say, no, this isn't right. And then to feel his presence in that room and knowing that he loved Derek more than I did. So communicating, getting alone, going to be with God. When you imitate God, when you imitate Jesus, you're imitating that, that presence, that closeness, that intimacy. When you imitate Jesus, you begin to say what he says. You begin to say what God says. I love Matthew 10, 19 and 20. It says, When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. 
For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Isn't that great? That to me is so fabulous that we can rest calmly in the fact that even when we have no idea what to say, even when we're being attacked, even when horrible things are happening all around us, the words that will come out of our mouths are not our words, but the words of the Spirit of God when we ask for that. To imitate Jesus is to speak God's words. And and I don't know about you, but I always get like getting ready for this, um, to preach, to speak. Getting ready to do that is always hard, right? You like, oh, what am I going to say? And then how am I going to say that? And and then <clears throat> what should I say? And then um, then you come in and you and you you know I always pray that that the words that aren't from God will just fall away, and the things that are from God will will go and bear fruit, right? Um, that's, that's, what we, that's what we're called to do. But to know that, to have this deep confidence that uh, you can't mess it up. I always love that. You really can't. Like, God will work all of it out for good so you can say what he says. One of the things is is to is knowing scripture have you noticed like when you read through jesus is just like he knows the prophets he knows everything from like he knows the history he knows the like he says it he studied it he learned it he sat under wise teachers and he learned the scriptures and he could recite them does that describe you are you a student of scripture are you a student of the word are you reading it over and over again so that it becomes part of who you are and that you just speak it without trying? One of the things that you see over and over in Scripture is offering mercy. We're called to, um, to offer mercy. Um, to be compassionate, to be kind. Eric talked about this a couple weeks ago when, when he preached on uh, chap- the end of chapter 4 and talked about that, uh, that reality that we're to offer compassion and kindness, offering mercy. Exodus 34, 6 and 7 says, The Lord passed before him, Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation, right? So this, this great God who shows mercy to thousands over th- generations, I, I often wonder like what heaven's going to be like when all, or, or when we, when it's all over, right? What, what this new earth will look like and how, how populated it is with generation after generation after generation of people that God calls his own that he's shown love and mercy and, and, and forgiveness and compassion towards. Matthew 13, verse 14 says, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had, what, compassion on them and healed their sick. If you're going to imitate God, you have to open your eyes to see who's sick around you. I, I love that the village's theme is um, and tagline is healing the city one person at a time. Means you have to be studying people, right? It says he saw them, right? He he looked at them and he saw them, and his response isn't, oh great, a crowd. His his response is tearful and compassionate, and he heals their sick. He knows why they're there. When you look at the people congregating in the streets, 
and you look at the people that are these huge crowds that gather in these cities, do you have a lot of judgment in your heart? Do you have a lot of anger? Do you have a lot of fear? Or do you look at them and think, wow, do you have compassion? To imitate God is to have compassion. It's not to, <coughs> it's not to judge. It's not to, to fight. It's not to, it's not to correct. It's not to fix. It's to have compassion, and then offer the healing with, with that you've received. To imitate God, to imitate Jesus, is to, is to have compassion. Mark 6, 34 says, When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were sheep, like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Is that your response to the people around you? If you're imitating Jesus, when you see these crowds that, that are leaderless and, and look like they're just wandering around in culture and in society, when you see that as your response well, they get what they get. They deserve what they do for what they've done. Do you have compassion? When Jesus saw leaderless people, he began to teach them. Is that what you do? Do you offer that? To mimic God, to imitate God, is to be a teacher, is to be a guide, is to be the kind of friend who doesn't just leave you where you are, but walks with you. And for Jesus, it's always very personal. In Luke 7, starting with verse 12, he says, as, it says, As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier that was carrying, they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Out of a crowd, Jesus picks an individual, this mother who's a widow, whose son has died, her, her pain is huge. She's lost not only her husband, but now her only son. And I love that his heart to her. Is that, is that what happens with you? Does, does your heart go out to people? I, I was talking, I think, to Sue this week about how frustrating it is for me to be far away from my friends who have suffered such horrendous loss. My friend Dave, with Linda's death, I, I, I just want to be there, right? I want to put my arm around his shoulder and, and tell him I love him and I care about him. And there's no, there's no, there's no way to do that, right? But, but there's something about imitating God that allows our hearts to go out. And that means that we have to hurt, right? It, it's painful. It's painful to not be able to do anything. I, uh, over the last while, I've, I've, I've discovered the art of just praying. Um, when, when I, when I experience someone who's experiencing loss and when I'm in there and they're friends and I, and I want to reach out to them, I, I realize how helpless I really am, right? There's just nothing I can do. Um, what I can offer is, is not anything of great value. But what I can offer is presence and what I can offer is prayer. And to bring that person into the, into, into the presence of God, Jesus invites this woman to not cry. 
because he's there with her and he brings healing and hope. He brings life to that which was dead. It's deeply personal for Jesus. Is the pain and suffering around you deeply personal to you? Or do you become kind of distant from it? We're to, we're to show kindness and to show mercy to the people that God places in our paths. Is there a neighbor who's struggling? Can you help? Is there someone in the village who's lonely? Can you make a call? There's someone who's in need of having some bills paid. Can you help to do that? There's some kids who need a desk that they can sit at to learn. Can you help with that? A couple weeks ago, Eric talked about Ephesians 4.32 and said, if we should remember anything, we should remember that verse. And it says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Be kind to one another. Are you busy correcting people? Are you busy fixing them? Are you busy? busy doing those kinds of things or are you busy being kind? Thoughtful. To be kind, you have to actually think about the other person. And I love that in Ephesians 4, 32, it says to be tender-hearted. It has to move your heart. Is your heart so cold that it's difficult for you to put yourself, empathize, put yourself in the place of someone else? To imagine not the world as you see it, but imagine the world as they see it. We're to be kind and tender hearted and to forgive one another as Christ forgave us. How does Christ forgive you? <laughs> I, when I first read that verse a long, long time ago, I thought, how, how does. How does Christ forgive us? Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we're still sinners, while we're angry with God, while we're fighting against God, while we're ignoring God, while we are distant from God, while we are doing everything in our power to thwart what God's will and way is, that's when Jesus comes and dies for us and forgives us. I try to wrap my brain around that. I, I have trouble forgiving people who wrong me, right? Somebody cuts you off in traffic, yeah, you know, like <laughs> go after them, uh, cuss them out. Uh, try to punish them, somebody. It, it, it takes this whole different mindset to be able to say, I forgive you. It's okay. It's okay. To take the back seat. To not go to war. While we're at war with God, Jesus dies for us. While we are against him, while we seek to destroy his work and his way, God forgives us. So how should you forgive? <laughs> that same way. Psalm 103, verses 10 through 14 says, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. 
God has taken our sin and removed it as far as the east is from the west. In other words, as far as it can be removed. It can't be further away. So when we forgive, we're called to forgive that way. To put the sin that far away. I, I think one of my frustrations um, throughout my life is that I can forgive, but I have trouble forgetting, right? Are you, are you like that too? Where, where you, I forgive you, but then we kind of guard ourselves, right? We put up this little fence. Yeah, but I'm not going to let you too close because you're not going to get a second chance. You got one chance, you know. One chance, shame on you. Second chance, shame on me, right? We do that. Um, that whole sense of, uh, you'll not get me twice. Scripture doesn't invite us into that. Scripture invites us into forgiving time after time after time. 70 times 7, 490 times. Um, for those of you who are into uh, scriptural numbers, 7 is the number of perfection. 10 is the number of completeness. 7 times 7 times 10. It's the... The math is that you will forgive perfectly and completely, right? Perfectly and completely. And then you say, well, yeah, but they're going to hurt me again and it enables bad behaviors. Yes, it might well do that. And you might have to forgive again. And you might have to suffer again. One of the measures of our following Jesus is to understand his the depth of his forgiveness and then to forgive others the way that he forgave us. To do that, we have to show compassion. I, I love that God knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust, right? So he knows our weakness. He, it's not like, oh, um, and, if you have that mentality as you look at other people, people who've wronged you, if, if you can look at them and say, uh, they're just dust, right? They're just human. They're just broken. They're just messed up. We turn everyone into a perpetrator, everyone who's a perpetrator into the evil thing that can never be forgiven, and we count ourselves not amongst that group, and yet we too hurt others. The Father knows that we're dust. He knows our weakness. He knows our frailty. He knows that we can't get it right. This passage that Sue read earlier um, ends with um, this idea that we are, let's see, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You want to mimic God? You want to mimic the Father? You want to mimic Christ? Then submit to each other. Don't dominate. Don't win. Don't fight. Don't argue. Submit out of love and compassion and reverence for Christ. We're called to imitate Christ. We're called to imitate God. Paul, in another passage, says, imitate me as I imitate the, uh, Jesus, right? Follow me as I follow Christ. That's the invitation. It's the invitation to each other that we follow Christ and that those who follow us will only follow us in the way that we follow Christ. And that way is a way of submission. It's a way of smallness. It's a way of humility. It's a way of pain and suffering, by the way. If you thought that becoming a Christian would solve all your problems and heal um, everything and make your life wonderful, it will, 
but not the way you imagine. Not the way you imagine. In this world you will suffer. In this world you will have pain. That's true. And the cost of submission, the cost of forgiving, the cost of all that is to put yourself under. When Jesus takes our sin on himself, he takes it on himself and he makes himself nothing, Scripture says. You want to imitate God? Make yourself nothing. Can we do that? No. We can't. <laughs> we really can't. We try. We'd like to. I think all of us are kind of getting, oh, I'm, I'm inspired to try. And we can make some steps towards that, and we should. But even that, even that God forgives, right? Even that he forgives. Even our messed up, and he judges our hearts. He judges our our desire, right? So if I say in my heart, I want to be like that, that's what God honors. Not the, actual, not the actual ways in which that plays out, not in the actual words you say, but he knows our hearts. The Father knows our heart, and he knows what our intention was. So even if you mess it all up, he knows what our intention was, and guess what? The Spirit causes the evil parts of that to fall away and causes the good parts of that what that desire to be heard and lives be changed. Be imitators of God. Be imitators. Mimic, study, learn, watch, read, think, contemplate, and imitate. Any questions or pushbacks or thoughts, ideas? Hello? Yes. I was just wondering, several years ago you talked, you preached about a time in your life in which you were, kind of as you put it, slaving away to get up at four in the morning and go out to your porch and pray and as as you're kind of describing what Jesus did and it seemed like an imitation of Jesus at that time um, but then you heard some sort of I don't think it was a rebuke quite but it was God saying well who, who are you doing that for it's not for me and so I'm just wondering if you can kind of reflect on the call today to find the secret place and maybe it's not pray all night but it's something like it looks like I, I, I feel like it looks kind of like what you were doing and yet you felt like that was somehow a little misguided so I'm just wondering there. Sure. I, I think out of duty right when we do things out of duty rather than out of the desire for the presence of God right I, I think what I got trapped in, I think the original call was a good call, you know, like it's, yes, go be alone, discipline myself, because I was undisciplined, right? So I needed the discipline. I, I don't, by the way, consider that a bad thing. I don't consider that a horrible thing. I actually consider that a good thing to discipline myself to do that. And then I think what happened is I fell into the trap of it's a duty, rather than a privilege, right? So when you see Jesus going off alone with God, it's not out of duty or obligation, like, oh, okay, I gotta get up at four and go pray. It's like, I, I want to go hear what the Father says. I want to go talk with him. I have a big decision to make. I have important things that they're, I'm grieving. I'm, you know, so, so I think what I learned in all that was the discipline of doing that brought me to the place where I recognized that I was doing it out of duty and not out of the joy of just being in the presence. That's a great reflection. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? You, you talked about the importance of uh, when you forgive, really forgive. Forgive and forget. And, you know, obviously we, we don't want to say, I forgive you and yet hold something back, but I still need to punish you with some anger. 
uh, or with some distance or lack of love because that's what's going to make things better or protect me. But there is, is there not a place where sometimes I forgive you and I know that in this particular case, it could be abuse or trauma, I do need to distance myself from you. And where I can, I will wish for your good, I'll pray for your good, but, but there needs to be some appropriate boundaries. There, there is a place for that, correct? Sure, and uh, yeah, by all means, do not go and be abused again. Do not, uh, you know, if someone is horribly mistreating you, it's just wise to not re-engage. To not forgive, however, is a different thing, right? And so I, I think what's crucial with what you were saying is, yes, I forgive, I pray for you, but pray for their good, right? We, we, I think we often pray for their destruction, right? If you're like me, like, uh, I want to, yeah, I hope they get what they deserve, right? And I think it's more important that we pray for their good. I, when Jesus says, pray for your enemies, like, that's what he's doing. And we, you know, if you all just paused a moment and made a list of the people you are, you really don't like and you're really angry with and you consider enemies, do you pray for them and say, God, I hope they get theirs? Um, or do you pray and say, God, I hope that they turn to you and that, that a relationship could be restored, right? To always leave that as a hope. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh, I was just going to say, you talked about this a little bit, verse 14 of Psalm 103, or uh, 13 and 14, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him, for he understands how weak we are. He knows we are only dust, and I just, I don't know, I'm just really grateful for that insight, because it feels like in our heads, we understand the call to forgive, and then there's this big old struggle in our hearts in the living out of it. And I just, I just think about that picture of a father. Like when we are looking at our tired, struggling kids, we're understanding their weakness, and um, and there's a compassion that flows. And I just hear that invitation to look at each other with, like, understanding. Oh man, you're weak like me, dust like me, broken like me. And so you said it, but I just wanted, it's one of the things I'm really struck by. It feels like maybe a place for us to hold on to. Um, and in, in, the, in the big places we're trying to forgive or in the daily grind of, I, I remember hearing um, like enemy described like a very annoying person too. Like to not just think of the really hard people, but the daily challenging people too. So I don't know. I just wanted to say thanks for that and any other thoughts you had about it. Yeah. I, I think if you know people's journey, you often are not as surprised that, you know, like I know someone who was just horribly abused um, as a child and then they were a child abuser themselves and went to prison for it. And then, um, but just, when you hear, hear their story, you can't help but have compassion for them, even though what they did is horrible. If, you know, and I used to say, if, if the things that were done to me had been, or if the things that were done to these people that I met at like Teen Challenge uh, when I worked there, if that had been done to me, I'd hide myself in cocaine for the rest of my life too. Like I, you know, I would, I would be desperately, uh, it, so it, it's a, a matter of hearing their story and taking the time to understand the story. And I think that's where the father shows compassion to his children. He listens to us. He hears us. He doesn't just judge us by the outward action, but he knows our hearts. And, um, and he knows our frame. He knows our frailty and our weakness. I, I think that's hugely important for me as uh, to know my own frailty, to know, but then to then also give that to everyone else and let them know as well. Right. What you just said struck me. Uh, you know my job. You know my sure. job. I, I listen every day. My job is to listen to people like you just described, tell their story. And the thing I struggle with is not to be hard-hearted and, and flippant about stuff and, and, you know, 
create a little defense mechanism of my own so that I can hear this stuff every day and and not be blown away by it. I, and what, what struck me is that you and, and Eric and Mark and pastors in general have to do the same thing. I, I was just wondering what you do to keep yourself focused the right way. You right, know? and that is, and I think you might be doing this too, but it is going to be alone with God, right? To put, let him take it. I, I noticed my wife too, she's a nurse and people die and she has to deal with these horrible things every day. And if, you know, these really compassionate nurses burn out in, in a week because it's just too much. It's, people are suffering and horrible things and, and it's just too much to watch. And I think it's too much to hear. And I often ask people who work in the, in, in the, in the jobs that you do, uh, I know others in our community that do that as well. Um, so where do you go to, get rid of this, right? Because you're carrying a burden. Where do you go to let it go? And if it, and then it does have to be alone with the Father, I suspect, that is the only place. We should probably wrap this up. Thanks, guys, for the questions. And um, let's pray. Father, thank you that uh, you love us, that you have forgiven us. Help us to forgive those around us. Help us to imitate you, Father, to be like you. It's really hard for us. Thank you for forgiving us when we don't. Thank you for inviting us into doing that. And Father, for all who are struggling and in pain and who bear burdens, Father, give them space with you so they can be restored and renewed and that they can take joy in this journey that you call us to. Jesus name amen